lose their case. Uh, it, it's uh, it's horrible. Uh, give me your take on that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, R. Kelly has primary victims, right? I and mean, these are going to be all the victims that, that we talk about in, in the case. But then the secondary victims, like you mentioned, the family members, you know, they experience their own ideas and their thoughts about what they should have done or what they could have done and uh, how they should have responded and how they could have responded. I mean, there's so much that goes on. But then there's also tertiary victims, right? The, the communities in which people live in, and, you know, just the large scale minority communities. And there's so much that his behaviors have wrought, so much destruction that, that he has caused. That, you know, it seems only fitting that this is like a federal case just because of the widespread tentacles of his behavior. And, you know, this most recent witness, Eliseo, uh, was asked one of the obvious questions is, well, you know, you were 21 at the time. Why didn't you say anything? And she said she feared for her daughter's safety. They knew where her daughter lived. Believable, um, normal. Uh, you've heard this before. What do you think? Yeah, I think it's difficult for any victim, especially a woman, to come forward. Uh, I mean, it's even harder when it's a celebrity was powered. And the thing that kind of strikes me more is that he has like an entourage of helping him do these horrible crimes. So if he's able to control those people, you know, of course you're gonna, you're gonna be, you know, scared for your life, especially if you don't have the capital that he does to, you know, that can just like destroy you financially or, you know, or shame you publicly. So, um, yeah, it, it, that's that's pretty common, and it's, unfortunately, that's the common thing. So, Dr. Dr. John, I, I think it seems, with what we're hearing from these various witnesses and the allegations they're making, is that R. Kelly and his team were able to target them for some reason, maybe feeling they were uh, they were more susceptible. Is that a common trait by those, again, assuming the prosecutors can prove their case, by those that are accused of these kinds of crimes? Oh, absolutely. You know, you don't really, you, people don't target hard targets, right? So meaning that if, if you're going to be a victim, you're and you want to insulate yourself from becoming that kind of person. So then you won't be targeted. But absolutely, R. Kelly and his team have developed methods in which they can find individuals who are susceptible, either because they have a child or because they are a child, that they're going to find ways because they're a soft target, easy to manipulate, easy to coerce. And age has very little to do with it. Intelligence has very little to do with it. There's something in that person's life that R. Kelly and his team can exploit. They're going to use it, and they're going to use it to, to its maximum efficiency. Yeah, and it seems that uh, at this point, as they put this case on, again, we've talked about this before, the difference between the uh, uh, bolstering witnesses and those actually connected to the claims against R. Kelly. So we expect that to continue as this trial continues, and we will keep you posted on all of the developments in R. Kelly, uh, the 54-year-old facing a number of charges in federal court. We'll take a break. We'll come back. We've got more to do. We'll cover both in the federal court and in the cases we're covering here live on the network. Stay with you. After those days in the trial of R. Kelly, supporters flocked to the Brooklyn Federal Courthouse to show support for Robert Kelly. This time they played the disgraced king of R&B's step in the name of love as prosecutors stepped into the federal courthouse ready to go forward with their sex trafficking and RICO case against R. Kelly. The prosecution is expected to rest their case against R. Kelly next week. So far, accuser after accuser has testified about the sometimes bizarre, manipulative, and sexually illegal acts R. Kelly forced upon young women, girls, and one boy. The prosecution is arguing that this was a criminal enterprise with R. Kelly at the top, controlling an intricate web of assistants, security guards, and others to facilitate his desire to have sex with unwilling and sometimes underage women. The defense is arguing that these girls lied about their age and the women are exaggerating their claims of sexual assault. After the prosecution rests, the defense will have an opportunity to put on their case before a jury decides R. Kelly's fate. Will people testify on behalf of R. Kelly? Will the defense put on evidence showing his innocence? Or will the king take the stand in his own defense? With no cameras in court, Law and Crime Daily will bring you expert legal analysis of all the twists and turns in this high-profile case. And co-host Terry Austin. Terry, with, at least for you, what is left for the prosecution to prove that R. Kelly transported women for sex and was at the head of a racketeering act enterprise to have sex with women, girls, and boys. Well, the indictment specifically alleges that Kelly was transporting these people for sex and that he was the head of this enterprise. 
we've already seen witnesses who testified that he was transporting them for sex, that he bought plane tickets. But I think what the prosecution needs to do, if they haven't done so already, is to introduce actual plane records of tickets being purchased and other obvious evidence of things that have happened to corroborate what's going on. As far as the enterprise is concerned, if there are any texts or emails where they see Kelly directing individuals to do something on his behalf, say buy a plane ticket, I think they need to introduce that as well. That's great. Now, Dave, the prosecution is focusing on the sexual acts. The defense is focusing on, focusing on this isn't a criminal enterprise. Where should the jury be focusing on this case? Yeah, the prosecutors have used RICO to get into evidence some uh, things that could not come in a state case for like underage sex because there is a statute of limitations issue if you just charge it as it is. But if you add it to a RICO case as part of the predicate acts for a racketeering case, then it comes in. So you can see why the defense is upset about RICO. And the defense will say, well, RICO is made for the mafia. This is not the mafia. But that's old school. RICO is not just for the mafia anymore. It's for large schemes that are ongoing that involve two or more predicate crimes, and that would be what R. Kelly is accused of doing. And so I think the prosecution needs to focus on the evidence, the stories from the individuals who have testified so passionately at trial, and I think that'll lead to a conviction. Absolutely. Now, as the R. Kelly trial continues, I sat down with the singer's former attorney on his federal Brooklyn case, still representing on other cases, attorney Steve Greenberg, who gives us his thoughts on the case thus far. Take a listen. So far, I don't think the government's moved the needle. You know, they've proven perhaps that R. Kelly is a, a sexual deviant. They probably established that he likes underage girls. They've certainly established that he spread herpes. But those really aren't the crimes at issue here. What we're talking about here is a RICO enterprise. So did R. Kelly have people who worked for him, associated with him, uh, friends, family, employees, whatever the case may be, it doesn't have to be a formal structure, who went out and helped him to commit criminal acts? Did he have people who went out and recruited underage girls from him? And, and I don't think the government's moved the needle on that. We'll hear more from attorney Steve Greenberg next week as Lawn Crime Daily celebrates the renewal of our show and the start of the second season. Tune in on Monday for that one-on-one -on -one interview. Still ahead on Lawn Crime Daily, an unexpected...